Shall we get going? And then uh, people can yeah. join if they. If... <laughs> Shall I show the last one? Yep. Yeah. yeah, perfect, Sarah. So this is just one of the questions that we asked um, through Slido at the last one, just so as a reminder of what you stated your quick wins would be for the improvement of your transition service. Some obvious ones, of course. I don't think everyone expect what everyone's after as a main key worker. I've heard that many times. Engagement with adult services. A lot of that came up. As well as engagement with younger people. I think the, the actual crux of all of that, um, Sarah, is that um, essentially you've got to have those key people with the right communication. Uh, I think that's what people are, are really wanting and would consider quick wins to have the right people in the right roles and communicating the right thing would be really useful. It would be a, an absolute quick win for people, but it does seem to be one of the biggest barriers. And certainly at this time of the year, um, with all of the um, uh, pressures within the acute trusts and and the busyness of, of all services at the moment because everything's being cascaded down so certainly that's some of the things that we can talk about today when we when we cover stakeholders as well okay. all right then right i'll just share my screen if that's okay That's there, Stella. In slideshow mode? No, you're on yep, your okay. view at the moment. We're not on full screen. Thinking about it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Perfect. Um, so first of all, um, can I just say welcome to everybody again for joining us for what is our third session of the Bidet National Transition Nursing Network and the South Thames Paediatric Network Collaboration Events. And that's looking at um, transition and the quality improvement project for transition from the Bidet Trust and also looking at how we can support you as an organisation and individual providers to develop a network of best practice and learnings for um, transition, generally speaking. So um, for those people who don't know us or who haven't been able to join us um, thus far, I'm Stella Carney and I'm the Regional Nurse Advisor for Young People's Healthcare Transition in the South of England. And that's covering the South East and the South West of England. And um, I'm joined by Nigel Mills, who many of you will have seen this morning at his network meeting, is the absolute font of all knowledge from a, a transition point of view. And Nigel covers um, the uh, London region. So again, crosses over within many providers within your network as well. So um, certainly for um, myself and Nigel, we find it an absolute pleasure and, and a really useful collaboration to reach as many people as we can do within these meetings and, and have a consistent voice for transition moving forward. So today's session is going to look at um, just three key areas. We're going to I'll give you a really brief national update because there's been a couple of things that have come to fruition since we last met. And then we will look at the first aspect of the quality improvement um, process, which is the stakeholder analysis. And coupled with that, looking at the communication plan within, within that and also how to develop things like um, project groups and delivery groups to not only just put a strategy together, but, but a, a plan of how that actually is going to be delivered. But the real crux of today's session is going to be 
based more around transition tools because that's certainly an area that most people need that support, advice and focus on. And so we're actually going to focus on Ready Steady Go and we hope to, if time allows, and I'm sure it will, um, also can um, cover the um, Guji tool, so the growing up and gaining independence as well. So that's an area that, that Nigel is going to cover and uh, much later on. So just really briefly, uh, I'll just give you a quick update with what's going on nationally. So as well as the frameworks and the governance and insurances that we've been talking to you about forever, um, they are still in the process um, and they we believe they're off Ruth May's desk now and they are being signed off by NHS England and we are hoping they will be with us within, within the next month or two. But I'm just going to say watch this space as I have done for probably the past few months. But what has come to fruition um, in terms of our NHS work is that the um, community currencies for transition are stepping up and uh, there's a pilot for that starting in late spring and the community currencies are um, a tool essentially to uh, allocate funding to transition services because we know that transition services um, accrue extra resources that, that's needed. And we're still working on the CQC inspection criteria for transition, which is mainly it's adult focused, but certainly um, it has parallels with within um, child health as well. And there's also the um, transition codes being developed, and that's the SNOMED codes. And they're looking at three areas um, for three codes for transition being developed. So those young people who meet a transition criteria as code one, code two would be the um, those young people who have transferred. So at that transfer point and have gone into adult services. But and then the third thing is looking after the code to identify those people that will need transition services moving forward up to the age of 25, including the community um, uh, aspects as well. So that's from a, a governance and assurance point of view. And then from a, a um, guideline point of view there's been some progress within the palliative care and end of life arena first and foremost the together for short lives document has been updated and we were a part of that process uh, with together for short lives and we did circulate that so hopefully those people um many people have received that um, and then we've learned today that the end of life and palliative care booklet, we have been waiting on this for a little while to have a specific transition section um, incorporated into the main um, crux of the document. And that, again, has been confirmed today. So um, that's something that I, I can share a link to that um, after this meeting. So that's the national update of what's going on. Um, so in terms of this session, then we were going to look at the um, stakeholder analysis, which is the first stage of looking at the quality improvement model for, for transition. Essentially, we all know, because we, you know, we're, we've been in healthcare for a while, the stakeholder for a transition is any individual who has an interest or an influence over developing your transition pathways or your service as a whole. And that might be within your own provider, your organisation, or external to that. So that we have to consider that transition affects every aspect of a young person's life. So education, uh, social care, housing, all those sorts of things, uh, charity organisations. So they need to be considered when we're looking at stakeholder analysis as well. For ourselves as a network, our stakeholders cover primary, secondary and tertiary care as well. And, and that includes um, community services and charities that as we say but also and this is really important for you when you're thinking about who your influences are and um, it does now include things like the ICB and the, and the commissioners uh, many of you may well be here today and directors of nursing and directors of, of organizations and um, because what we need to do is have uh, almost like a a top-down approach with a push-up that meet in the middle and um, that's when you get a, a cohesive collaborative service moving forward. So we do know that um, these stakeholders can be in excess of 30 individuals or groups uh, in actual fact if you're in a, a big tertiary arena or within a network that could be up to 150 as well. So it, it is um, 
all encompassing because transition affects every aspect of a young person's life. So over the next 10, 15 minutes or so, I'm just going to break down that process with you in terms of um, who we're looking at within stakeholders. And we'll separate that out into looking at internal and external whole organisation stakeholders for transition. Then pair that down to look at stakeholders within individual organisations, including both adult and children's services. And then look at um, a brief look at how we would, could look at doing a stakeholder analysis grid to look at who, who holds the power in developing transition services and who holds immense interest and how they, they can be um, collaborated and, and a communication plan to, to meet with them, their individual needs, essentially. Once you've identified who the stakeholders are for your organisation, then we have to put into place um, an action plan, essentially, and identify perhaps an advisory group or a steering group, so a focus group to look at the overall strategy for transition. And then with that, look at individual delivery groups and work streams to say how it, this is going to be um, um, embedded within individual services. So before we get into the nitty gritty, I think you'll remember that, um, hopefully you'll remember those that joined us last time, we always end these sessions on homework time, don't we? And uh, we did set some homework last time for you guys to think about um, this, this next session. And we asked you to start thinking about who those stakeholders were within your organisations and the wider health and social care arena within your area or region. So if we can, I'd love to hand over to Sarah just to do a quick Slido, if you don't mind. So if you could all log on to Slido.com. And oh, I do beg your pardon, I've, I've missed out the code there. Um, Sarah, can you share that code with us? So the question here is, in addition to the stakeholder roles of transition, which a few I've given a few examples on the left hand side there. So the executive lead for transition, a transition lead, service consultants for both adult and, ch and children's um, heads of nursing and the clinical nurse specialists, apart from those absolutely key fundamental stakeholder roles, which other roles do you feel should be prominent within your stakeholder analysis grid when, when you come to do it? We got the code there, Sara. Yep. It's on the, it should, everyone should be seeing it. Yeah, it's happening. People are starting to put it in. Start. Perfect. Thank you very much. We have key worker at the moment. Okay. Yeah, and we've got the acute dis learning disability nurse there. That's absolutely um, a key role. GPs, fabulous. It's great. There's more, obviously more than one pe person thinking education needs to be in there and adult healthcare professionals. Therapies, absolutely. Yeah, the good people thinking about work as well, but, um, it's fabulous. And it's love. It's great to see that we are including um, family and carers and family representation there as well.
and absolutely they're a young person right in the center of that Give that another minute. It's someone, just one person typing. It's easy to see how how rapidly your interested parties grow. Yes. Stakeholders. That's brilliant. Some couldn't ask for more. To be honest, you you've hit so many. Um, aspects there which is absolutely brilliant so thank you for that that's fabulous so if you don't mind stop sh stopping sharing that um I'll, I'll move on i've stopped then so. yeah thank you so much you're back again now stella brilliant thank you OK, so in terms of those stakeholders, we're, we're going to sort of look collectively at the first two aspects um, of that, that stakeholder analysis. So within your feedback there, we were looking at both um, stakeholders external to your organisation and, and as, you, as we say, other services as well, but also services within your own providers and, and organisations. So essentially, Within, when we look at internal and external key stakeholders, um, we have to recognise and identify who they are for a whole organisation. And we've all already ascertained that that's anybody with an influence or interest in transition. And I keep coming back to those terms because when we do the stakeholder analysis grid, they are really important in where we place our communicate communication plan for them. So if you just Park that in your mind for a little second before we get onto that grid. Um, so we, we, you very readily touched on all the other authorities that we need to involve with. So um, education and social care and um, work life balance, all those sorts of things. And thank goodness you did think big because um, what did we have about 20, 25 different um, aspects there? And it, it really is an exhaustive list. Um, uh, we can't obviously name them all. Um, but we do have to look at every aspect, uh, certainly from wh when you're looking at the external um, aspects. In, in order to have that collaborative approach, we need to be thinking of heads of nursing, chief executives, um, and um, also our um, learning disabilities colleagues and our SEND colleagues in primary care, within commissioners, and all of the other organisations that, that you talked about as well. And it's really great to recognise who has the interest and influence within those so that we can actually work with them from the start. So if you're at the beginning of the process of developing your transition services or a transition pathway, ideally we want to get those influencers and those interested parties in with your communication from the start instead of us all just developing something and then cascading it out and expecting everybody to adopt it. We all know that it's much more um, effective if we actually develop things together and and go through the process together and then we all can work to the same um, outcome for that as well. Um, in terms of our own structure, our own organisations and providers, one of the key things is that we have to do that collaboratively with children's and adult services. And I know that um, some organisations work differently to others and it can be a challenge um, because they tend to work very differently. But if we think about de de delivering age appropriate health care, then this does um, affect the whole spectrum. And if you think about the new all age continuing care that um, the NHS is um, supporting and, and uh, delivering, then we have to look at that whole 
aspect looking at children's and adult services and it goes back to making sure that we we are bringing people along and not just delivering something that we've created um, and expecting potentially adult services to embark on once we we've um, developed it so it's about bringing people along the way and we know that although we can have an overall policy for transition within a whole organisation or provider, we do need to look at building individual pathways with those individual services. So again, it's about identifying who those key opinion leaders are within each of those services in both adults and children, and also nursing and medical um, stakeholders as well. And it's about extending that team as well within your own organisation. And, and again, that can be such a huge list, but it's making sure that we don't forget things like healthcare assistants, admin staff, multidisciplinary coordinators, and things like um, the um, transformation teams or the patient experience teams, those sorts of things. So it's about including everybody within your, your whole organisation. So really mind map it and just think about who you interact with in other aspects of your your work in life not just transition and think do they have a role to play within developing my own transition service here as well and all importantly which was great to see on your feedback there it's about not forgetting the young people they are fundamentally the biggest stakeholder that we can have um, in terms of making sure that we're de developing services to meet their needs um, at the right time um, for them as well. And it's about allowing them to contribute to this process as well. Um, we, we can't just develop something that is purely meeting our needs from a governance and assurance point of view. It has to meet the needs of those young people as well. So they are integral um, to the whole stakeholder analysis. Um, if you, sorry, Stella, if you yeah. think back to from, on, uh, from the pond into the sea, one of the yes. key points made within that was that services had developed to meet the needs of their services themselves rather than the needs of the young people that were um, attending those services. Yeah, absolutely. So we're coming to the stakeholder grid now. So this, well, once we've identified those external stakeholders or in internal stakeholders, it's then about thinking, well, where do they sit in terms of how and when we want to communicate with them and what we communicate with them? Well, to do that, we need to understand whether they are um, enablers, so influencers in the whole project, or whether they could be considered gatekeepers or barriers. Is there something within their own working restrictions that might make it difficult for them to engage or to endorse the work that we're doing? And, and they are equally as important to you as your enablers. So it's about getting them included and on board um, from the start, but your communication with them may be different, the frequency might be different, the type of communication um, and the uh, whether it's media or written or, or what have you. Um, but obviously, once we've identified those enablers, we need to um, identify those early adopters. We want to really get on board those people who can make the biggest difference um, to you perhaps early on to get that momentum going. So the real movers and the shakers, those people that can actually make those decisions readily. And it's about, as I mentioned before, building those relationships from the start rather than trying to embed something that you've created and expect them to come along with it and then having to almost sell the concept to them. It's, uh, it's much better to, to do it the other way around. So this is a, um, an example of a stakeholder analysis grid and what it looks like is on the um, first axis there is, is looking at those people who might have um, the power to, to make different, the difference within your organisation. And on the bottom access there, who's got the highest interest within transition? So, for example, you could have um, a chief executive uh, nominated for transition um, who has got one, she's got, he or she has got um, high power in terms of making those differences. If they're equally as interested, they can have significant um, effects on building your, your services as well. So we would look to manage them closely. So within, within that upper right quadrant of the actual grid there. Um, again, if you had a, um, a nurse specialist in epilepsy, for example, who 
has to have a, a significant amount of power um, because she's actually leading a service with young people who are going through transition but doesn't necessarily have a great interest into that you still would want to keep them her, them informed and at least satisfied because you again you want to bring her uh, her or him along the way with you and ultimately it's about keeping that communication open so that ultimately we can move them into the manage closely because they that person would be um, a, a really influential figure within managing transition service as well. So the quadrants that we're looking at there are those people who have got high power and high interest, you want to manage them closely. And though conversely, those with little power and little interest, we certainly still want to keep them included and um, make keep the awareness and um, share what, what's happening in the world of transition because it does affect every single service. Um, but you just, it's a minimum effort, um, but you would monitor that because anybody can change within this, this spectrum. The more informed you keep people and the more you communicate with them, then you've always got the opportunity of that level of interest to rise as well so then you you'd want to keep them more involved as well so one of these um tasks that you might want to do is once you have looked at your own stakeholder analysis is to actually put some roles i would say into these positions um into this grid and and the, i can share the grid with you um independent independently and through um sarah and sally to help, it's a great template for you to be able to develop that communication plan of how you actually effectively go to get to your um, key opinion leaders and stakeholders for, for transition. So once you have identified those um, influencers and those early adopters and the movers and shakers and how you, you're going to communicate, the next step is to look at developing a focus group. So that might be in the form of an advisory group or a steering group. And the steering group um, or advisory group are there to task in developing the overarching strategy for transition. And essentially there, we want to make sure that it's a, a really um, sustainable process. So we, we need to look at developing terms of reference and a chair and um, make sure that the um, members should include those people who we've identified within the high power, high interest on that stakeholder grid, include both adults and children's services that we've talked about, people from education and social care, and expert panel mem members. So if you've got somebody who is um, an expert within transition, then obviously they need to be an integral part of this group as well. And that includes young people because they are the experts in their own, own transition as well. Once you've, you've got that focus group set up, what it really should include, as well as the young people, is um, meeting minutes and, and an action plan. Um, and so that should be developed to give a step-by-step -step approach as to what needs to be done to develop transition services, who's going to actually deliver them in terms of roles and responsibilities, and have specific timelines as well to make sure it's achievable within um, a, a given amount of time. And once you've, you've got that action plan, then that's something then you can cascade down to the individual delivery groups. So the de delivery groups are those people who are actually on the floor, those who are actually responsible for delivering those transition services. And then obviously they're made up of both medical and nursing teams, as well as adult and um, children's teams as well. And they're responsible for embedding the overall strategies with the individual services. Um, and that includes developing pathways specific to their, their given area. And the only way you can do that really is, is looking at benchmarking your own service um, and then looking at a gap analysis to form your next steps of how you actually you're going to develop those pathways. Right. OK, I think somebody's just left the um, microphone open. If we could just all make sure that we're on mute, that'd be brilliant. Um, and then, as we mentioned, en engage directly with the young people to develop age appropriate um, health care as well. So that was a little bit of whistle stop tour and they're the key points for that. So just to reiterate, it's about considering both internal and external stakeholders, both adult and children's services, identifying those people who are influencers and the potential barriers to progress, looking at that stakeholder analysis grid to, to demonstrate who you need to uh, communicate with 
most commonly, most effectively, and um, then look at the, creating those focus groups and delivery groups to actually embed the um, transition services and, and pathways moving forward. So that's my little lot for now. Um, I will come back uh, later on once uh, I've handed over to Nigel just to talk about the, ne ne the next steps and the, the future sessions. But with no further ado, what I'd like to do is just um, stop sharing now and hand over to Nigel, who's going to look at the Ready, Steady, Go transition tool. And also, if, if we can, time allows, um, the transition um, Guji model as well. Thanks, Dylan. While I'm getting my slides up, I will just say that the the stakeholder analysis tool is, a, is just a useful tool for us to use, for you to use. It's not hard and fast. You might want to revisit it a number of times during the course of your project because people's responsibilities and um, their levels of influence might change during the course of your project. And it's worth, it's just a tool for you to think, where can I best put my resources? Having identified maybe up to um, 30 or so stakeholders, how do you um, best use your resources and your time to do to access them? Sorry, I'm, I shouldn't try and do two things at once. I'm absolutely lousy <laughs> at that. Uh, <laughs> in the in the meantime, Sarah, the first my first slide was the um, Slido number one. If you wouldn't mind. Uh, is it back? Yeah, sorry at the moment I've my presentation has just disappeared, although I had it earlier on. Stella, do you have access to the questions that, that I had earlier? Because I'm just struggling to find my presentation for some reason. Yeah, I'll have a quick look for that. The first question is what transition tool do you currently use? Neither did you hear that from Sarah? Oh yes, we're, we're active. You can just put RSG for ready, steady, go. I think we all know what you mean then. If you're not using anything currently, could you put that as well? Just put nothing. Okay. Oh, 10 steps. That's good to see. In reality, there are there are actually very few tools that are that are widely used. There might be some locally developed ones. Um, later on, I'd be interested to hear about some of those. OK, I don't see any more coming in. OK, heads, I see you there. OK, I've now found my slides. No one noticed that. That was that was smoother than anything, wasn't it? Should I stop sharing or go to the next one? Yes, please. I'm about to use. Da, da, da. Right, it's just loading. So obviously, and a few of you are used to Ready, Steady, Go, and um, a number of you will have seen it. It is the most widely used and most, wide, most widely known of the transition tools. Uh, apologies for those of you who are using it, but it's, it's worth just revisiting. So Ready, Steady, Go, Hello is usually known as Ready, Steady, Go. 
Um, our leaflets questionnaires statements that promote discussions around transition and how what the young person understands about their condition, their health, and about how we help them prepare for their move to adult services. The questionnaires are used to develop an individualised transition plan, and I'll explain a bit more of that in a minute. Um, and that's possi possibly the most important aspect of it. One of the great things about it is it is free. It is widely known. You can use it as an online resource and therefore upload it to your electronic patient record system, or it could be done as a, a paper si uh, system. Challenge with that is then about how you actually save the paper copies. I've said excellent resources. It's worth revisiting their site, even if you're using their tool, simply because they're constantly updating and, and developing new, new tools to go alongside Ready, Steady, Go. It is widely used, which means a lot of young people have actually come in contact with it already. It can be used in both paediatric and adult services, and that the adult service part is the hello tool, which is a very useful thing to, to see how a young person is arriving into an, um, an adult service. So this is the home page. This is the, the, the website. Um, TIA, although it's known as Ready, Steady, Go, TIA is a further development of the whole tool and the and their the practice they're using in Southampton. The tool itself was originally developed by Janet McDonough in Birmingham, um, and then Arvind developed it further at Southampton, and she launched it as Ready, Steady, Go. It's worth visiting the site, as I say, and play and have a look at what's there. One of the things that it starts out with and it provides is a generic introduction tool. A lot of people are looking to develop their own introduction to explain what transition is. Ready Steady Go has that document there ready for you to, to have a look at. It is very generic, so if you if considering using it, have a look and see if it would be useful for your team or whether it's something you actually need to adapt. But if you have nothing, it could be useful just to use that even as a stopgap to explain to young people and to their families what actually transition is at the beginning of the process. It's often useful for them to be able to take something away to think more widely about what what we've been discussing once we first initially discuss transition. Hello, this is just the first page of it. So this is the hello to adult services. And as I said, this is very, very useful for the person arriving into the adult service and possibly not even who has been through a transition process to get you get them into the adult service. Crash landers, new referrals into an adult service. It can be a very useful tool for the, for the adult service to understand what that young person understands about their condition and their treatments and their health generally. These are the documents, widely spaced because I copied out of the website. It's very attractive. A lot of young people say that they do like it because it is a, it is colourful. The format remains the same throughout. So once they're familiar with the tool, once they've seen the first, once they've seen the first document, they'll be able to recognise that for the rest of the times. Sorry, whoever's got their microphone on, could they switch it off, please? <laughs> So I've just highlighted the, the steady, the second stage. There are eight themes, and the themes are the, the areas described as knowledge, self-advocacy, health and lifestyle. And there are 35 statements, they're not questions as such. So you can see, possibly see, that it says, I understand, I can't see it on my screen. <laughs> the writing's a bit small. But it's for the young person to have a look at and think, actually, I understand my condition. I really don't need to discuss that any further at the moment. And that works through a number of different statements. There are 35 there. My advice to anyone coming across this, using it for the first time, is don't rely on the, quest, the answer that the young person has given. If they're saying that they do understand their, condi their condition, I might like to explore a bit more about what they understand about their condition. Their knowledge can sometimes change. Their, their condition itself might change along the way. Their relationships might change. There are questions about relationships and sexual health. We need to be careful in how they respond, and I wouldn't just take take it um, for granted. If they say, I don't need to discuss this at the moment, I would like to explore that a little bit more if there is time to do that. Their answers then feed into an individualised transition plan, and this is how we support that young person to prepare them for adult services. Where they've identified that they might want to discuss something a little bit further, or they don't understand something, 
we then write the individual's tra transition plan with them to identify how we're going to support them or what support they need and how we're going to follow up with them to make sure that they do get that understanding, which we'll then pick up on the next time round to see how that's developed. This is the hello to adult services, which I said we can use to, uh, to understand what their knowledge is as they arrive into an adult service. If they have transferred from paediatric services, it's still worth starting, even within the adult service, a transition plan there. Because if there is any areas of their, their knowledge and understanding that is slightly lacking, or they do need more support with, we want to understand how we're going to provide that support. So we, we can then start another transition plan in adult service or continue the transition plan that they started on in the paediatric service to make sure that we're supporting them as, as fully as we possibly can. The things to consider when you're using Ready Steady Go, there are different ways it can be used. It's not prescriptive. Um, if you ask Arvind, she wouldn't tell you exactly how to use it. She will tell you how she uses it. It is an adaptable tool that you can use to meet the needs of your patients and in your environment and in your clinic. It was, a, you know, people start, had to start using it virtually. It was used in the face-to-face -face clinic originally. Options are to send it out in advance so the young person has time to work through it and, and bring it in with them. The challenge there is, are they actually going to remember to bring it with them? Will they fill it in or and not fill it in and then arrive in the clinic and say, oh, sorry, no, I forgot it. If we hand it out to them pre-clinic while they're waiting to come to the waiting room, while they're waiting in the waiting room, they might not want to answer their, honest, their questions too honestly because their parent might be looking over their shoulder. Do they want to discuss sexual health or their sexual identity? Are they going to answer that honestly with the parents sitting beside them? Are they going to have, will we know that they've had that opportunity to, to answer the questions without someone looking at it? Are they going to answer their questions honestly? This is where we need to explore a little bit more. It's a communication tool as much as anything to understand. And this is very similar to what I said about head. It's the fact that we're open to asking the questions and engaging in the discussion with them around their any issues they might be having. If it's saved electronically, that's fine. We'll keep a copy of that. If it is a paper version, what's going to happen to that patient uh, paper version? Do we keep a copy and upload it to our system? Does the young person have a copy of it to see where they are in their own um, changing needs? Do they get a copy of the transition plan that we're writing? How do we manage those kind of things? These are just things to think about if you are using it electronically or in a paper form. Obviously in clinic, it can take a while to go through these properly, to spend the time discussing what they've written in their answers. If it's when it's used to write a transition plan, who's going to update that and when and how? There's often comments around that it is not relevant to the patient group. A lot of people we've come across kind of say, we tried using Ready Steady Go, it doesn't fit our patient group. Um, for a long time, there were, there were questions about using it with people with learning disabilities. There is an easy read version, but that might not still meet the needs of the actual young people who are being um, faced with it. I think if people find it's not working for their patient group, it might be the way that you need to think you need to use it in a different way. So it might be there's issues about sending out in advance. It might be supporting a young person to fill it in for themselves without their parent being there. There are different ways to think about the way you're actually using the tool itself. Hate to bring it up, but it is something to think about. If we're using paper versions, particularly if we're handing out the leaflets as well, there is a cost implication about that. And we need to think, how are we going, how are we going to fund this? Colour printing is expensive. Important thing we need to, to get to share with young people, there is no pass or fail in this. We're not going to criticise them for not understanding something about their condition. They're not going to fail because they haven't, um, they don't know how to make an appointment for themselves, for instance. They're not going to be held back in paediatric services if they have not answered all the questions completely. It's, no, it's not a test. It is a tool for us to understand how to support them.
that was Ready Steady Go, and I rushed through that in a bit because I understand that quite a few of you do know about Ready Steady Go. Um, and I want to move on to the growing up, gaining independence. But I want to, to move on to the second slider. There is an issue around uh, the 16th birthday because of the Mental Capacity Act coming in and the relevance of that. Yet those people that are capable of doing so should be signing their own consent forms. I'd like to understand from you, do you currently provide to young people and their families any information before their 16th birthday to prepare them on how do you go about signing a consent form? We find a lot of parents assume they will be signing consent forms you know, in, for infinity, whereas young people themselves don't know the fact that they will be signing the, a consent form for themselves. Do you provide them with any information to help them prepare for this? Well, I mean, if that was everyone, that, that's quite Okay. I think that'll be as many answers. Yeah. We'll okay, that's fine. If you'd like to stop sharing. So, oh, it's you, Stella. I'll have to share, Mr. Chair, again. <laughs> You've just appeared back on my screen. Sorry, I've just I've got to go back to where my tools were again. There we go. So this was my, part of my feelings that. Um, something I recognised that young people and their families were not being prepared for signing a consent form, and um, we we have stories of young people being presented with a, a consent form and not knowing how to fill it in. Although there's obviously a healthcare provider there with them to discuss them, but signing it because they don't quite know what to do. This is one of the things we tried to address with a tool called Growing Up Gaining Independence. And I was involved in developing this, and it was to meet a need that I, I felt wasn't being addressed with some of the other tools. So it is a simple framework that enables us to talk about transition with young people, but to talk more actually about the skills they need, the knowledge they need, and the understanding they need to take over their own health care as they grow up. Not necessarily people who are going through transition, because not everyone does, but they are skill, still set that everybody needs to manage their own health care. It wasn't designed to replace Ready Steady Go or any established good practice that was happening. And then the, the environment that I was in, there was some good practice happening, there were some transition clinics happening that it were long established. And I didn't want to say to them, you can't now do that. It was developed to be used as a standalone tool. So if someone didn't have any practice in place, if they weren't using Ready Steady Go, what else could they use? So I provided that we provided this for them. Um, but it, the idea was that they could use it with other tools as well. So we know about obviously about transition. Moving from children, young people services into adult services, and this could be at, at different ages. In the environment I was working in, we also had people move from the children's services into dedicated adolescent services, and this was actually in a different hospital. Now, by your strict definition of transition, that doesn't fit because transition is the move into adult services. But my feeling was we need to be preparing young people for those adolescent services as well. There are also some services are commissioned to treat children and young people beyond their 18th birthday. There are also situations where some clinicians will look after a young person but in both paediatric and adult services um, and were saying to me that actually I don't need to talk about transition because I'm still going to be looking after them once they get to the adult service. Kind of missing the point of what transition was 
but you can see where, where their argument came from. There are also young people who are under multiple specialties. I've only put two in there. Potentially those specialties could be changing at, to adult services at 16 or at 18. But there are a number of services that they'd be under. There are also sometimes within paediatric services, children, young people services, services that don't exist in the adult domain. So a specialist service for condition X, there might not be an equivalent adult service for condition X. It might be a syndrome. What realistically happens is the young people are then divided, in effect, into their separate body parts to be seen by a renal specialist, a cardio cardiac specialist, but not someone who sees them because they have condition X, but because they have a cardiac problem or a renal problem. There are also young people who are being treated by a paediatric service, children, young people's adult and people's service, who we don't necessarily know that their treatment will continue until they are in, move into an adult service. Their treatment might come to an end. If it's a tertiary centre, they might go back to their uh, local service to continue their treatment. And it's very confusing for, for a clinician then to think, do I need to start transition or not? There's also some um, conditions where we might not want to talk about preparing them for adult services at 14, when we're supposed to be started transition, simply because it, it might be detrimental to the way they respond to their treatment. There are intensive physiotherapy treatments for things like um, regional pain syndrome. Very painful physiotherapy. If I was being told at 14 that the treatment I'm having that is painful might not cure me, in effect, because I, I need to prepare, be prepared for adult services, why would I undergo that painful treatment? For mental health services, sometimes we might not want to discuss the fact that we need to prepare you for adult services. That's not the language you want to be using because we actually want them to be removed away from the mental health services if possible. And then there are new referrals that come in from the after the age of 14, who we need to prepare rapidly for adult health care. And Ready Steady Go wouldn't necessarily fit in the time scale that we've got. Because the things we need to consider is how many appointments are we going to have with that young person? How many contact times are we going to have with that young person between the age of 14, if that's when we start our, our transition, and their transfer to adult service? If we're moving, the, if they're going to move over at 16 and they're only on the annual MOT type appointment, we will only see them two or three times. And to cover ready, steady, and go within that time is quite a prompt. And how much time is there in, within clinic itself to address Ready Steady Go? By the time you have um, got feedback on where the young person is and what's happened to them in the, in the, since you last seen them, how much time is there then to have a, a lengthy discussion around transition? I asked from the slider, do we, are we preparing them for the Mental Capacity Act and the implications of the Mental Capacity Act? Are we preparing families in advance for the loss of parental, parental responsibility? After the age of 18, they do not have parental responsibility. Were there issues around um, capacity, mental capacity? Are we talking to families about applying for quarter protection deputyships and how they can be involved in decision making in the future? These are all things that, are, that I cover with the growing up gaining independence. So I'd like to ask a, a question now. If there are concerns around someone's mental capacity, do you within your service currently provide information to their families about the fact that they will be losing parental responsibility on the 18th birthday and what the process would be for them to be decision makers after that person's 18th birthday? So Sarah, if you could get that. That's really encouraging. Oh, 
Well, I have to say that the where I was working at the time, it was overwhelmingly people were not mentioning anything about this. So it's really encouraging to see that there are there are services that do. OK, I think we've. Stopped there. I'm afraid my when I return, it seems to take me back to the beginning for some reason. So bear with me while I catch back up again to where we were. So actually on to growing up gaining independence. Now we were referring to it as as googie for a long time and it was developed at great ormond street um there is a new transition in improvement manager there who's told me that they found a an obscure reference to googie as being something <laughs> deviantly sexual and they're not referring to it as googie anymore they're referring to it as growing up gaining independence um i've known it as googie for a long time and i find it very difficult not to call, call it that so it's a it's a two-part strategy that talks not just about transition to adult services, but actually talks about preparation for adulthood. And this avoids the need to talk about transition, where we're uncertain if that's the term we should be using, whether that's the term that might actually um, not be appropriate. So there's the generic bit that is relevant for any young person that comes in through the door, and then the specialty specific. The generic part and especially specific, you could just use the generic part on its own. It's relevant whether or not the young person will go into the adult service. Um, it doesn't matter what specialty they're under. It can be used with people with a learning disability or additional needs. And we did a lot of work with the palliative care team. At one time, we were looking at a separate pathway for young people um, with life limiting conditions, and they said, no, this is actually appropriate for, for young people who may not survive into adulthood or may not survive long in adulthood. We should still be preparing their, promoting their independence regardless. It's a very simplest form. It was information sheets to give out in clinic or uploaded ready for a virtual clinic. And these were to be given out the first appropriate appointment after the young person's 12th birthday. Remembering that if they have a learning disability or additionally, they might need things in a different format. And part one was that general information that any young person needs. It's encouraging young people to be seen on their own. OK, you, you may be able to do that, maybe not, but it's just a reminder for that. Then a discussion around the legal and financial changes that would happen at that person's 16th birthday. And there on the right hand side, you can see there's a more detailed breakdown of what what aspects that would cover. Then there's the general um, health and development for any young person relevant, any young person. So we're not looking at someone with necessarily with a long term condition. This is just relevant to any young person that, that might come through A&E, for instance, as well. How to manage appointments. One of the things we found and that it's come to light again and recently in, in some things that I've seen, young people not knowing how to make GP appointments for themselves. Their medical history, sorry, I jumped over that one. We're often asked as we're growing up, do, is there a family history of diabetes? Is there, uh, did you have any significant illnesses when you were younger? And often we don't actually know that. So this was to encourage families to have these discussions with a young person. So they were armed with that information. I said earlier that time was one of the, the factors within a clinic for using Ready, Steady, Go. The person I had in mind to use this tool was the busiest clinician I knew, whose appointments were actually 10 minutes long. I knew that he was double booked quite often. Asking him to 
go through Ready, Steady, Go or any other tool I just didn't think was feasible and he wouldn't actually do it. By providing him with a piece of paper that he could hand out and ask the family and young person to go and dis away and discuss this together, took the pressure off him. So then we're also looking at then asking them to look at what look at local primary care changes. A lot of families are unaware that they will lose the local paediatrician once they move into adult services. Do they have a relationship with their GP? So the last point on the right hand side is recommend that young person goes to see their GP and connect with their GP practice. The part two was the specialty specific bit. There are some generic bits within this and then some individualized bits again. So what's the usual age of transfer from the service? These are the kind of things that families need to know in advance. The young person needs to know in advance. Who is the person that they can contact to talk about and, and be their, their key worker? What are the support organisations that will be there in the adult service? These often change, more come into play. What they need to know some new service information. And I've got another slide on that, on, on what were the key things they wanted to know. What arrangements are there for that young person to, to meet the new team? And what are the possibilities, what are the options for them to go and actually explore that service, to look at what the outpatient department looks like, how you check in, where you go to. So that could be in a generic leaflet, once again, for that service. But then for each individual patient, we need to be discussing their own medical history their medication knowledge um, and the dates of their last appointment within the paediatric service and the date that the new service will will take over responsibility for their care. One of the things I found working in clinics often was despite seeking their transition clinic, despite them meeting an adult service in that clinic with the paediatric service, walking out afterwards and talking, asking them how it went, Families not understanding that that was their last appointment with the paediatric service, even though it had been explained to them in the time, that, that time. So they need that documented. So this was a breakdown of the new service information that young people said they wanted and that I got out of um, some of the key um, documents. What does the new service do? often they, uh, young people will come from a specialised clinic, they'll go into a more generalised clinic and they need to understand that there will be other kind of um, conditions that they will see there. Who are the members within the team? Who do they need to contact? Often they've got a good relationship with the, the paediatric service. They want to know who is in that adult service and not just who the consultants are, who is the rest of the team connected to that, that service? How do they, who do they contact for their appointments and emergencies, for general queries? that's very specific. The young people told us that if they were running late for their appointment, they wanted to be able to say to someone, I'm just around the corner. I'm going to be late, but I am, I've got, I got lost. I want, I will be there. Because the worst thing that could happen to them was to turn up at the reception desk and someone to say, you're late. And for them to be told off, they said, what they said was, we would rather not go than be told off in front of a lot of other people in the clinic. So they just needed a contact number, not for, general appointments we put through to the appointment office which often happens but who's there within that clinic they can say i'll be there in a minute i've gone to the wrong floor whatever it is how does the clinic operate where is it how do they get there are they clinics at different times than, the, than that they're used to are they evening or weekend clinics what is that procedure for actually booking in um do they go for a, to a different floor do they so they book in and go and have a blood test first. What what happens? And who will they see in clinic? They want these kind of these kind of things in advance just to take some of the stress away. And when they're in clinic, what are the other patients that they're going to be seeing there? Don't forget that often these will be the have come from being the oldest patient within a clinic, within a paediatric clinic, to now being the youngest patient within a clinic. They may see people with advanced stages of their own condition or first point people with other conditions that are being treated there. It's scary to see those people. They need to know what they're going to come and encounter. If there's a possibility they're going to be become an inpatient, what kind of ward are they going to go to? Often they'll have been uh, on a specialised ward. Is it going to be a general ward? Will there be A&E admissions with there? 
Are they likely to get someone with dementia beside them? Are they likely to get someone who's been in a road traffic accident beside them? They also need to know, once again, that they are going to be older people on that ward. They need to know about visiting hours. This is quite often something within paediatrics that they're not used to. Um, when I was visiting family on ward, I, it was a shock to me to find that I couldn't go until late in the afternoon. You need to be quite independent to manage an, your own time on a ward when very few people can come and see you, when you're used to having people around you all the time. What's the TV access like? Do they have to go and buy a card from reception? Are they going to be sitting there? How expensive is it going to be? These are different things from when they're in the paediatric service and on a paediatric ward. And are there any young people's groups that they can join when they go into an adult hospital or an adult ward? And then finally, particularly for families, what's the long learning disability support within that adult service or within that adult hospital if it's a different hospital to them? Who do they contact? How do they contact? So that they can get reasonable adjustments in place before they get there, before there's actually an issue. So they can discuss what the needs of that young person are before they get into the adult service. That's the web page link. It is being updated at the moment. There, um, this was worked on three or four years ago. There hasn't been anyone working on it since, but the new transition improvement manager at, at GOSH has now started working on it again and um, revising some of the literature. That's just an example of the information provided for families of young people with a learning disability. So this was the information provided to setting up um, court of deputiesship and taking on responsibility and what kind of things they need to put in place. And this was information we were providing even at age 12, 13, 14 for families. So they knew about this well in advance. So they were prepared for what was coming. That was a bit of a sprint through there. Um, are there any questions from anybody in that? As I say, I, it, it is a tool that is still being developed. Um, I was developing it at the time. I haven't had any input into it more recently. I can connect you with the person who's just now working on it. Um, and they're exploring much more how they can be embedded with Ready, Steady, Go and have the two working in collaboration. And there we are. Over to you for any questions. Well, I have a quick slurp of water. Slurp. Nigel, from my perspective, I, I found that incredibly useful um, to absolutely use it as particularly the, the grown up and gain an independence as a, a real communication tool. And the things that you've actually suggested there, the considerations in every single aspect are really how you get the best out of any of these tools. So um, as we say, we, we will circulate these slides and that will give people the reference of the types of things that you need to consider at each stage, because I think it, that's the crux of it all. But you can have a, a guideline, you can have um, a, a policy, but if you don't know how to use it, then you're, um, you're stuck, aren't you? But hopefully that was a real good insight of the types of questions that you should be asking young people at each stage. And what we found was that often families didn't think of sharing the skill set that they had in negotiating healthcare yep. with their, their son, their daughter, their child. Absolutely. Until someone prompted it to them. And it particularly when we don't have much time in clinic, it's not really our responsibility to teach a young person how to make an appointment for themselves. That is something that they can do and practice with their family. Yeah. And it also supports the, the family to see that their their child is becoming more independent because they're having a they're part of the process then to help prepare them. I can see that there is a hand up there. Vicky. Hi, thank you. That was so helpful. And um, especially the growing up, gaining independence and um, going through it. I've actually, I have seen the website um, when I was looking for something before, but actually you explaining its origins and how it's used and stuff is particularly about um, how we can engage clinician, other clinicians who are naturally very busy but you know we still need to be supporting that that process i think that was really helpful so i'm a learning disability nurse for mm -hmm. children and young people um with learning disability and autism where they access the r acute general hospital um and i suppose one of the challenges that i 
have come across slash I'm thinking about is the Ready Steady Go tool. So in principle, I, I generally like it and I like the fact that there is some of the some of the resources have been made into easy read. So not all of them. The transition plan hasn't specifically and it's not digital yet. Um, but I suppose for my cohort of patients and I suppose for some others who may have uh, you know several medical needs or health needs is one like you said earlier transition can start at different times and different things but when I was looking at using this tool um I'm mindful that some of our families and or some of our young people potentially could end up with several plans that was my fear when I started working on growing up getting independence that was one of my fears as well um I think I've softened on it I've I've by now I should have got more used to Ready Steady Go and I think if the teams are coordinated and this is the thing then they there won't be multiple copies of it yeah it's it's, a, yeah. it's, it's, it's us that need to work together it's not for the for the families to have to negotiate that this is our problem to solve yeah that's what I was thinking um and I was wondering what your thoughts were so I also don't want to present it you know as a concept as an idea to my family groups mm. and then roll their eyes and go it's another set of paperwork it's another it, you know, because I know that my families have an awful lot of paperwork and we want it to be a meaningful process don't we not a not a tick box paperwork exercise so yeah yeah now if you go back through the chat at the very beginning Bethan from Lewisham uses Red Steady Go extensively and she said that she's very happy to support anyone who who has any questions about it i would take that to her and see see what response she has on that will do thank you very much and nigel just um to go through the chat there um emma um has made a comment which i, I really do agree with as well um in that she from the grown up and gaining independence point of view she loves the idea that it's recognizing the young person is becoming an adult without it actually being part of a, a threatening process that they are going to be moving over to adult services so as you say um, we should be supporting any young person to grow up into their adult and adolescent and adult years and we're specifically talking about transition but it's a great tool to do that isn't it to open it out to everybody i hope so and the, and it's a way of normalizing normalizing things yeah and say it, it is because it is for everyone so it's not a kind of like uh, in a clinic setting why is that person got a copy of, of this thing why well, exactly. i haven't got a copy of it it's not it's um and particularly where i was working sometimes we only see a young person one time but we weren't entirely sure because they might be a neurofoil coming for tests yeah and dependent on the result of those tests would be whether they stayed with that hospital or not it didn't matter they were coming in once we could give them that information no clinician had to make a decision whether to give something out or not or whether to yes. start the transition process or not it was relevant and actual fact one clinician was got so fired up with it he was giving it to people over 16 and they were saying it was useful because they'd never thought of the things so you know it's there it's it's free to use yes definitely i'm slightly biased i must admit but you know <laughs> And actually, whichever tool you use, um, thinking things through from a from a governance point of view, um, they they act to provide the evidence, don't they? So if we're thinking about CQT inspection criteria, one of the things that they're going to want to know is that there is um, a, a transition tool or a transition plan in place. So by having it by using these and having it in place, you're already satisfying that inspection criteria. Um, and also, you know, any governance process that move forward and your benchmarking. Um, if you if you go through the Bidet, um and University of Surrey benchmarking tool, many aspects of the evidence that you need to demonstrate that your uh, your services are uh, on par actually are embedded within Red Steady Go or um, Grown Up and Gaining Independence. So it they they cover more than one task, in my opinion. Mm, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was just, re just replying to a... <laughs> uh, were you? <laughs> That's OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Well, just before we <laughs> begin to close the session, then, is are there any more questions for Nigel? No? Okay then. 
So um, essentially then, um, today has been very much been about um, looking at our stakeholder analysis um, and also looking at the tools that we can use within um, the services. In terms of um, communication wise, there was a couple of things within the chat. Um, certainly um, somebody's asked if we can now share who is leading things at GOSH with them and we can make sure that we'll provide that information to Sarah and Sally who can distribute that um, through. Uh, I'll also be sharing the overall slides and, and also sharing that template for the stakeholder analysis grid. So the next se session is moving through into March and that's um, session three that's looking at the diagnostic and um, solution design side of things and then we will be covering more transition tools that might be the 10 steps for example mm -hmm. so um in terms of what we need to be doing to move things forward from because this is an, an, an this is a learning group it's a, a sharing group but it's also an, a call to action as well to use this time as an opportunity to develop your services so at each stage we we have this call to action and um, we should probably look at uh, you embedding those stakeholder analysis um, work that you did last time within that grid so that you can develop your communication plan but then if we can what I'd love you to do for next time is think about um, just how your service your transition service looks like what it looks like now um, and what literally the, all the nitty-gritty things you know how many services need transition how many are actually embarking on transition and um, are there specific transition clinics in place is there a transition lead an education lead a, 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 an executive lead should i say um all those aspects of so a real overview of what your transition service looks like and then the second thing then is to um align that with what would be a benchmarking tool so think about what you would like your future state to look like so how would you like transition to look in the future based on the um, gold standards um, for a service so based on the national guidelines so again um, we can provide you with um, links to all of the national guidelines and also a link to the Bidet and University of Surrey benchmarking tool and that will help you to actually make that gap analysis if you like and that that's what we're going to be looking at next time so yeah, homework moving forward is to look at what your current state is at the moment and what you would dream your gold standard service for transition to look like in the future through a benchmarking exercise and looking at national guidelines and standards uh, moving forward. So just to say, um, we are all still here as um, Padet Nursing uh, Networks and we're here till about mid-May for Nigel and I'm still here till about the end of May um, and we talked last time about the end of the project coming at that point um, but we are still um, hopeful that we, we are able to at least hand over the work that we've done from a, to a regional um, point of view or, or look at creative ways of how we can actually embed tra a transition network within each of the ind individual regions within specific roles as well. So if you need to get in touch with us, then please feel free to do so. They're all our, of our contact details. Um, in the meantime, I'll just open the floor out to any further questions and then I'll hand back over to Sarah, um, who I think has just got one further um, aspect to, to go through and um, we'll take it from there. So. Any questions at all? No, in which case, Sarah and Sally, I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much. The really is just to get an idea of, of what it is that you felt you've learnt from today's session, what you're going to take forward. We'd really like to um, have a good grasp on on how everyone's feeling these sessions are going and how we could potentially go forward. <clears throat> In 
would be fantastic if this time we could get everyone responding. I know we usually get around nine, but there's around 20 people in the in the chat in the in the call. Sorry. UG seems to be the thing here. I didn't know it was it meant anything. Not quite okay, Nigel. <laughs> there, there were apparently there was one entry in an online urban dictionary. I've never heard <laughs> of it. No, I just worried about who looked it up to find that. <laughs> <laughs> After this, everyone's just going to be giggling. <laughs> <laughs> It's really good to see actually that um the grown up and in, in, gaining independence is something that people have really taken on board today because we are i think we all are aware of ready steady go whether we're utilizing it or whether we have challenges or, or actually absolutely love it but i don't know that everybody has had that in-depth information about grown up and gaining independence before so it's great to see that um up in lights there and um, at the center of every, all of the comments interesting to see if people that if everyone goes forward with really silly go how they how implementation goes for them i've heard um different different stories when it comes to that that'll be interesting to know after this one person still typing I think that's everything. That's brilliant. So um thank you so much for that feedback. It just let allows us to understand that we're actually meeting your needs and in the right way. So it's great to see that things like um the information on the new end of life um mm -hmm. programs that are or well, guidelines that are coming out and that the transition grid was useful to you and specifically the transition tools, which is what we really wanted to see the focus of, of um, our work here today. So that's brilliant. So from my point of view, I want to thank you for all you, you, everybody's commitment to be here. Certainly if those, there's many people that are on the call that have been here for all three, it is a, a stepwise approach and it, it, it but you can dip in to the odd one, but to have it collectively, um, will by the end of the sessions, you'll have encountered everything that there is in the world of transition in terms of the QI model and the guidelines and the transition tools that are available to you, as well as understanding the role of uh, transition leads. And then there'll be a synopsis at the end to say what we've learned as a group and how we are going to move things forward in, in an overall call to action. So. From my point of view, I just want to say thank you and thank you to Sally and um, Sarah for um, supporting us and working with us. And um, I will see you in March. Yeah. Nice to see you all again. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel thank you. and Stella for an amazing, another amazing uh, thing. There's so much to digest. So uh, I'm sure you've given people lots and lots of ideas and lots of things to go away and share with their colleagues. And um, good luck, everybody. Hope you. Uh, have some some progress in uh, doing uh, all that you're doing in your local centres with your local young people. And we'll see you all in March. See you in March then. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.